Welcome to Wicked Week here at Darkcast Network. I'm Ray of Rogue Darkness Podcast, here for today's episode of Darkcast Network's Wicked Week. Spooky season continues. As you know, it's Darkcast Network's favorite season. Today is spooky true crime stories, but don't be scared. We will be right here with you to see you through. In the fall of 2001, approximately 40,000 students attended Penn State at the main campus in State College, Pennsylvania. On Halloween, thousands of them donned costumes and went to celebrate with friends at bars, clubs, and off-campus apartments. Hyun Jong Cindy Song was one of these students. The 21-year-old integrative arts major was set to graduate the following spring and usually didn't party during the week. But even though it was a Wednesday, it was also Halloween, so Cindy donned a bunny outfit and went clubbing with friends. By all accounts, she had a great night. But in the early hours of November 1st, 2001, something happened to Cindy's song, and she was never seen alive again. I'm Kona Gallagher, host of And Then They Were Gone, and today I'm going to tell you the story of Hun Jong Cindy Song. October 31st, 2001 was the first semester of Cindy's senior year at Penn State. That night, Cindy dressed in a bunny costume and joined her friends Stacy Paik and Lisa Kim at a college club called Players Night Club. Cindy and her friends stayed until around 2 a.m., at which point they went back to a friend's apartment and played video games. At 4 a.m., Stacy drove Cindy home. She dropped her off, but didn't stay to make sure Cindy made it inside. Remember, this is 2001 before the age of social media and constant connection. Cindy was a full-time student with two jobs, and she lived in an off-campus apartment. Not only that, but her parents were in South Korea, so presumably they didn't talk daily. So no one immediately thought anything was wrong when a few days passed without anybody hearing from her. But that Saturday, when Cindy didn't show up for a shift at a local Korean restaurant, people started to realize that something was wrong. That day, friends called police and reported Cindy missing. Unfortunately, as we often see in the case of missing adults, Ferguson Township Police didn't seem to initially take the report very seriously. Because it was the weekend when she was reported missing, the report went to patrol and didn't even land on a detective's desk until that Monday. When I first started researching this case and saw that Stacy didn't wait to see if Cindy made it safely inside, my immediate thought was, all right, well, somebody snatched her. But when her friends and police actually went through her apartment, they found evidence that Cindy did, in fact, make it inside. Cindy had been wearing false eyelashes as part of her costume, and when police searched her apartment on Monday, November 5th, they found those on her bathroom sink. They also found the backpack that she normally carried with her. And most alarmingly, they found her cell phone, which was powered off. Now, what they didn't find was Cindy's purse, her wallet, her keys, or the bunny costume, other than the eyelashes. They also saw no signs of a struggle or any other foul play. Now, based on this, it appears as though Cindy left her apartment willingly, but didn't necessarily plan to be gone for long. She took her keys in her purse, locking the door from the outside, but she left her phone behind. She also didn't bother to change out of her bunny costume. That led investigators to believe that she left shortly after being dropped off. Our relationships with cell phones were different in 2001, so it wasn't glued to your hand like it is now. If it's four in the morning, it makes sense that Cindy would leave it behind because who's she going to be calling at that point? Cindy's mother came over from Korea to search for her daughter. Cindy had gone through a rough breakup about a month prior to her disappearance, and her family speculated that Cindy could have died by suicide or just decided to leave because of this. Her friends disagreed, though. They said that, yes, Cindy had been upset about the breakup, but it was a month ago and she had been dealing with it. Cindy was even in therapy and had been taking medication because of this. And beyond that, her friends were sure she was not the type of person to just up and leave. Plus, a search of her apartment revealed that she had bought a new computer that was due to be delivered in a few days. And, most importantly, she had a ticket for a Britney Spears concert the next week. And, again, 2001, so this is a huge deal. At this point, police are thinking that the most likely scenario is that Cindy popped out to a 24-hour grocery store to grab something quickly, and somebody got a hold of her either on her way there or her way back. 
There was a giant grocery store right by her house, and Cindy was known to go there at all hours of the night to pick up snacks or what have you. But Cindy's credit cards weren't used there, and by the time detectives went to the store to get surveillance tape, there was nothing from that night. Given the lack of clues in Cindy's disappearance, the police had to look at a variety of different possibilities. Stranger abductions are exceedingly rare, so investigators started looking into the people in Cindy's life. They interviewed all of her friends, her family, her ex-boyfriend Patrick, but according to Detective Brian Sprinkle, quote, there wasn't any indication that he was involved in any way, end quote. There were reported sightings of Cindy as far away as Philadelphia, but none of them turned out to be her. Soon, police seemingly came to to the conclusion that it wasn't anybody in her life who was responsible for her disappearance and that it was, in fact, a stranger abduction. And unfortunately, they began to believe that she was kidnapped and murdered. So efforts began to focus on body retrieval. In the days and weeks after her disappearance, the dumpsters around her neighborhood were searched, as were the local woods. Aerial searches were also performed to no avail. Meanwhile, tensions are high back in State College. Cindy's family immediately took action upon arriving stateside, and one of the first things they did was clean out Cindy's apartment, which destroyed any potential physical evidence that may have been left behind. The Song family also joined up with Penn State student groups, including the Black Caucus and the Korean Undergraduate Students Association and other community members to form the Coalition for the Search for Cindy Song. On January 31st, 2002, the group held a press conference in which they were highly critical of both Penn State and the Ferguson Township Police Department. According to an article in the Daily Collegian, the Song family spokesperson, Jim Han, said at the press conference, quote, Words cannot begin to express the agony the Song family has felt since the disappearance of their daughter. This has been compounded by the poor investigation, end quote. Cindy's mother, Bonsoon, was so upset with the way Ferguson Township was handling the investigation that she delivered a petition to the governor's office in Harrisburg with 15,000 signatures demanding that state police take over the investigation full time. In a move that seems a little retaliatory, Detective Brian Sprinkle and Ferguson Township Police stopped communicating with the Song family. He claims that this decision was made, quote, for Cindy's sake in the case and not the family, adding, quote, we pretty much cut them off, end quote. And just to give you a little more context of the contentious relationship between the Song family and the police tasked with finding Cindy, Detective Sprinkle said of the family, quote, It's a cultural thing. I mean, they were upset and frustrated. They didn't understand how things worked here in the U.S. End quote. The next year, Cindy's story was featured in Unsolved Mysteries. Many tips were called in, but unfortunately, none of them led to Cindy. But then in 2003, her story took a much darker path. In June of that year, five bodies were found on the Wilkes-Barre property of a man named Hugo Selensky, Another man named Paul Weekly, who was alleged to be Selensky's accomplice, told police that Selensky had bragged about killing over 20 people, and one of them was Cindy Song. Investigators from Ferguson Township went up to interview Weekly, who claimed that Selensky, a convicted bank robber and a friend, pharmacist Michael Jason Kurkowski Jr., had been in State College the night Cindy disappeared. Weekly said that Selensky and Kurkowski saw Cindy walking alone in her bunny costume, mistook her for a prostitute, and kidnapped her. According to Weekly, the pair drove her 200 miles back to Selensky's property in Wilkesbury and held her captive for several days while assaulting her before finally murdering her. Weekly even said that they kept Cindy's bunny ears as a souvenir. Nearly two years after Cindy's disappearance, investigators felt that they were finally getting somewhere. While everyone was hopeful that this lead would give a resolution to Cindy's story, it just wasn't meant to be. Four of the five bodies were identified, but the one unidentified body was ruled out to be Cindy. Later, as authorities investigated Weekly further, they found evidence on his computer that he had done searches on Cindy Song's case. Without a body or any other evidence linking Selensky to Cindy's disappearance, police eventually discounted Weekly's story. 
though these bodies were found in 2003, Hugo Selinski wasn't convicted of murdering Michael Kurkowski and his girlfriend Tammy Fassett until 2015, though Selinski was convicted of lesser charges related to the bodies of two local drug dealers that were also found on his property. But here's where things get extra spooky. Selinski's original lawyer and a private investigator were charged with witness intimidation and bribery. During this, a reporter for The Morning Call dug up the grand jury findings from this case and found this on page one. Quote, Authorities have linked the discovery of approximately a dozen deceased slash destroyed human bodies at a Luzerne County residence to Selinski. Then on page five, it says Luzerne County authorities believe that Selinski was directly involved in the murder of approximately 12 human beings found burned and buried in a pit in his backyard. End quote. This was in 2015, and to this day, these other bodies have never been identified. Cindy Song remains missing. If you'd like to hear more stories of unsolved missing persons, be sure to subscribe to And Then They Were Gone. Good evening, listener. My name is DJ, and I'm the host of the Mythical True Crime Podcast. I cover captivating tales of true crime, legends, and unsolved mysteries from the realms of mythology and reality. Uncover the dark true tales of modern legends with our spoken narratives that blend history, crime, and the supernatural. Tonight's story involves a young man named Yoshiro Hattori, who was born in the Achi Prefecture in Japan, the second of the three children of Yamachi Hattori, an engineer, and his wife Miko Hattori. He was 16 years old and went to the Baton Rouge, Louisiana school in August 1992 as part of an American Field Service student exchange program. He also had received a scholarship from the Merida Foundation for his trip. Yoshi, which he liked to go by, was hosted as a homestay student in Baton Rouge by Richard and Holly Haymaker, who was a professor and a physician, respectively, and their teenage son, Webb. Two months into his stay in the United States, Yoshi and his homestay brother, Webb, received an invitation to a Halloween party that was to happen on October 17, 1992. It was organized for Japanese exchange students only. Yoshi went dressed in a white tuxedo in imitation of John Travolta's character in the film Saturday Night Fever. At around 8 p.m., Webb and Yoshi drove to the neighborhood in East Baton Rouge Parish, where the party was supposed to be beheld. The two youths mistook the residence of Rodney Pears, a 30-year-old supermarket butcher, and his wife Bonnie for their intended destination due to the dissimilarity of the address and the Halloween decorations on the outside of the home. Yoshi and Webb walked up to the front door's house and rang the doorbell. No one came to the front door, but Bonnie had opened the side door letting into the cardport and saw that Webb was standing a few yards away. Webb was wearing a neck brace due to an injury and bandages as part of his Halloween costume. He attempted to address Bonnie, but later she testified, saying that she panicked when Yoshi appeared from around the corner and moved briskly towards her. He slammed the door and told her husband Rodney to get his gun. Now outside, Webb inferred that he and Yoshi had come to the wrong house. They were preparing to return to their car when Rodney opened the carport door armed with a 44 Magnum revolver. Yoshi stepped back towards Rodney, saying, We're here just for the party. Rodney pointed the gun at him and yelled, Freeze! Webb caught sight of the firearm and shouted warning to Yoshi. But Yoshi had limited English and was not wearing his contact lenses that evening, so it was possible that he didn't understand Rodney's command to freeze and he did not see the weapon, or he, he might not even thought that it was just some Halloween prank. Yoshi was holding a camera, which Rodney mistook for a weapon. And when Yoshi continued moving towards Rodney, Rodney fired his gun at him in a distance of about five feet, hitting him in the chest and retreating back inside of his house. Webb ran into the home next door for help, returning with the neighbor to find Yoshi badly wounded and lying on his back. Rodney did not come out of the house until the police arrived about 40 minutes later after the shooting. 
Bonnie shouted to the neighbors to, quote, go away when the neighbors called for help. The shot pierced the upper and lower lobes of Yoshi's left lung and exited through the area of the seventh rib. He died in the ambulance minutes later from blood loss. Now, initially, the Baton Rouge Police Department quickly questioned the release of Rodney and declined to charge him with any crime because, quote, in their view, Rodney had been within his rights to shoot the trespasser. Only after the Louisiana governor, Edwin Edwards, and the Japanese consul of New Orleans presented, uh, protested that Rodney be charged with manslaughter. Now, Rodney's defense said that his claim that Yoshi was extremely unusual manner of moving that was any reasonable person would find it, quote, scary. It emphasized that Rodney was just an average Joe, a man just like the jury members' neighbors, a man who likes sugar in his grits. At trial, Rodney testified that the moment just before the shooting, this is his quote, it was a person coming from behind the car, moving real fast. At that point, I pointed the gun, hollered, freeze. The person kept coming towards me, moving very erratically. At that time, I hollered for him to stop. He didn't. He kept moving forward. I remember him laughing. I was scared to death. This person was not going to stop. He was going to do harm to me. Rodney testified that he shot Yoshi once in the chest when the youth was about five feet away. He said, quote, I felt I had no choice. I'm very sorry for this to have ever happened. A police detective testified that Rodney said to him before, Boy, I messed up. I made a mistake. District Attorney Doug Monroe concentrated on establishing that it was not reasonable for Rodney, a six foot two tall man, armed to be so fearful of a polite, friendly, unarmed, 130, uh, 130 pound boy who rang the doorbell, even if he walked in towards him unexpectedly in the carport, and that Rodney is just justifying, uh, is not justified using deadly force. The defense further argued that Rodney was, in large part, reacting reasonably to his wife's panic, Bonnie, who testified for an hour that, about the incident, during of which he cried several times. Her quote saying, quote, he, referring to Yoshi, was coming real fast towards me. I had never had somebody come at me like that before. I was terrified. Rodney did not hesitate or question her because instead of he went to retrieve his handgun with a laser sight stored in a suitcase in the bedroom. There was no thinking involved, she said. I just, I wish I could have thought. I wish I could have just thought, Bonnie continued. While giving a description of Yoshi at the trial, Bonnie said, I guess he appeared oriental. He could have been Mexican or whatever. He was taller than me and his skin was darker colored. The trial lasted seven days. The jury returned a not guilty verdict after deliberating for approximately three hours. Courtroom spectators applauded the verdict when it was announced. Now, later, there was a civil trial uh, that happened. In a civil action, however, the court found Rodney liable to Yoshi's parents for $650,000 in damages, which they used to establish two charitable funds in their son's name. One to fund the U.S. high school students wishing to visit Japan, and also one to fund organizations that lobby for gun control. The lawyers of Yoshi's parents argued that while Rodney and his wife acted unreasonably, Bonnie overreacted in the presence of the two teens outside the house, and the couple behaved unre unreasonably by not communicating with each other to convey what exactly the perceived threat was. They had not taken the best path of safety. Remaining inside the house and calling the police, they had erred in taking offensive action rather than defensive action. And Rodney used his firearms too quickly without assessing the situation, firing a warning shot or shooting to wound. Further, the much larger Rodney could have easily subdued the short, slightly built Yoshi. Contrary to Rodney's claim that Yoshi was moving strangely and quickly towards him, forensic evidence demonstrates that Yoshi actually was moving very slowly, if not at all, and his hands and arms were away from his body, indicating he was in no threatening position. Overall, a far greater show of force was used than it was supposed to be appropriate. 
Now, the Pearsons appealed the decision, and in the Louisiana Court of Appeals, they upheld the judgment in October 1995. Second appeal in the Supreme Court of Louisiana was rejected in January 1996. And of the $650,000 judgment, Rodney's insurance company paid 100000 of that, while Rodney himself was technically responsible for paying the remaining $550,000. Now, after the trial, Rodney told the press that he was never again, he would never again own a gun. And a 2013 source said that he had lost his home and his supermarket job following the shooting and was now living in a trailer park. The Japanese public were shocked by the killing of and by Rodney's acquittal. Yoshi's parents and his American host parents, the Haymakers, went on to become active campaigners for gun law reform in the United States. In November 1993, they met with President Bill Clinton, who was presented with a petition signed by 1.7 million Japanese citizens urging stronger gun control. A petition signed by 120,000 American citizens was also presented to Congress. The Hataris and the Haymakers lent their support to the Brady Bill, originally introduced in the House of Representatives in 1991, which mandated background checks and a five-day waiting period for the purchase of firearms in the United States. It was signed into law by President Bill Clinton November 30, 1993, as the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act. Now, according to Walter Mondale, the U.S. ambassador to Japan, who presented Yoshi's parents with a copy of the act December 3, 1993, Yoshi's death had, quote, a very definitive impact on passage of the Brady Bill. And the Hattori and Haymaker families remained active in gun control activism. In March 2018, following the Stoneman Douglas High School shooting, the Hattori's participated in the March for Our Lives and spoke with survivors. Following the killing, some argued that had Yoshi been white, Bonnie would not have reacted the way she did. The Haymakers started an interview, followed the trial, and that had Hattori been white, they believe that he never would have been killed, noting that Bonnie Gears said that she was first noticed that Hattori had darker color skin than her, and in her testimony she did define that he was a different race than her. Some in the Baton Rouge said that Bonnie was frightened because she believed that Yoshi was a light-skinned black man. Bonnie rejected notions that her reactions had been racially motivated, stating it was his fast movement towards the door that scared me, not the color of his skin. And in the court of public opinion, I say it was racially motivated. She overreacted, her husband, not thinking, grabbed his gun and fired it at a perceived threat, taking the life of a young 16-year-old child. Put down in the comments what you think. And if you like this, I have many other stories very similar, some dealing with the supernatural, some vaguely leading into the paranormal. Again, this is DJ with the Mythical True Crime Podcast, associate of the Dark Cast Network of Indie Podcasters. Hope you have a happy Halloween. Good night. Hey there, I'm CJ of Beyond the Rainbow, True Crimes of the LGBTQ Plus Podcast. The silent film era started around the 1900s and it continued on until almost the 1930s. That's when talkies, movies with sound and dialogue, took over between 1926 and 1930. But before that, silent film stars were gushed upon by their fans of the time. Charlie Chaplin, Lillian Gish, Mary Pickford, and Rudolph Valentino... They were some of the most well-known actors of the era. And though he was nowhere near as popular as silent film star Rudolph Valentino, Ramon Navarro had devastatingly good looks and leading man charm. He had a chiseled chin, great bone structure, dark wavy hair, intense eyes, and a heavy Mexican accent. But since he was a silent film actor... His accent did not interfere with his getting American roles. Ramon was a devout Catholic and gay, 
which was a huge point of inner conflict for him. As well, being an actor and openly gay would be instant career death during that time. So he chose to stay closeted, which would play a part in his untimely death. Ramon was successful in his career and with keeping his sexual identity a secret, he hired male sex workers to fulfill his fantasies and his needs. Besides sex workers being a vice, he also leaned heavily on alcohol as a coping mechanism. Ramon was born in 1900, and by 1968, he was retired from acting and living out his retirement in his beautiful Laurel Canyon home in Los Angeles, California. But Ramon was now a frail old man, and the night before Halloween on October 30th, there was a knock on Ramon's door. Wearing a red and blue striped robe, Ramon opened the door and he greeted two guests. A 22-year-old burly man and a 17-year-old skinny teenage boy. Ramon had been expecting them. The two young men had acquired Ramon's phone number from a former sex worker Ramon had entertained previously. The two young men were brothers and both had experience being hustlers before. They knew exactly why they were there. The old man that they were there to see still hired sex workers, but mostly for their companionship. That night, the three men drank, laughed, and played songs on Ramon's piano. Usually, Ramon would get plastered and sex was never performed. He was lonely and thrilled to have the young men there just for the company. At one point during the night, Ramon showed the young man a picture of him in his youthful days, when he was muscular and handsome. He was wearing a toga from when he starred in the original version of the movie Ben-Hur. The youngest of the two brothers said, eh, It doesn't look like you. In order to prove he could still be virile, Ramon invited the young men to his bedroom for sex. And after the deed was done the Burley brothers demanded $5,000 rumored to be in the house. And in 1968, that was big money. Hell, that's big money to me even today. I can just imagine what it would have been worth back then. Then the little brother joined in demanding money from Ramon. Ramon told him he didn't keep such a significant amount of money on the premises. But the brothers didn't believe him. Ramon's denials were met with a beating. The brothers then picked a bloodied and exhausted Ramon up off the ground, and they hit him again, causing him to fall back onto the floor. Afraid he would fall unconscious, the brothers dragged Ramon into the bathroom to splash cold water on his face and to slap him awake. Ramon stumbled out of the bathroom and fell to his knees. He started to pray. One of the brothers found a cane and a glove in Ramon's closet. He put the glove on, and he began dancing around the room, twirling the cane over to where Ramon was. He took the cane, and he smashed it into Ramon's genitals. Then the two young men took turns striking Ramon's private area with the cane. They tied him up with an electrical cord and continued the beating. Finally, they tossed a battered Ramon onto his bed, and this is where Ramon would die from choking on his own blood. The younger brother scratched Ramon's face up, and then they both rummaged through Ramon's house, dumping things on the floor, including pictures of Ramon's youthful days. Their intention was to make their crimes look like a scorned woman had perpetrated it. One last touch by the brothers was to write this on Ramon's bathroom mirror. Us girls are better than faggots. The brothers were arrested for Ramon's murder. At their trial, Ramon's whole life was on display for everyone to hear, and the brothers' defense team declared Ramon was just an old fag who deserved to die. That same sentiment was echoed by the young men's mother, who also took the stand. In the end, the brothers were sentenced to life in prison, but they were let out after only a few years. 
Halloween of 1968 saw no justice for the once very loved silent film actor Ramon Navarro. Rest in power, Ramon. Happy Halloween, everyone. And I'm CJ from Beyond the Rainbow True Crimes of the LGBTQ+. Remember, it's not a crime to be gay, unless you're a murderer. Hello, this is Kelsey from Castles and Cryptids. We cover paranormal and true crime cases. And today I will be sharing the case of the Texarkana Moonlight Murders. This is a series of unsolved murders and violent attacks that were committed in the area of Texarkana, which is on the border of Texas and Arkansas, in the spring of 1946 by a serial killer known as the Phantom Killer or the Phantom Slayer. This killer attacked eight people within the span of ten weeks, five of whom later died, and the case remains unsolved today. Texarkana was a relatively violent place, with robberies and killings being fairly common, and when the crimes were first reported, people paid very little attention to them. The murders began on February 22, 1946, when around 11.55 p.m., Jimmy Hollis, age 25, and his girlfriend Mary Jean Larry, age 19, were parked on a secluded road known as Lover's Lane after going to see a movie. The area was about 50 feet off from an unpaved road and about 100 yards from the last row of city homes. A man wearing a white cloth mask resembling a pillowcase with eye holes cut out appeared at Hollis' driver's side door and shone a flashlight into the window of the car. He then pointed a pistol at the couple. Hollis responded that he had the wrong person, believing that this could only be a prank. The hooded man responded, quote, I don't want to kill you, fellow, so do as I say. The couple were then ordered out of their car using the driver's side door. Hollis was ordered to, quote, take off his goddamn britches. And then he was struck twice in the head with the pistol and fell to the ground. Girlfriend Larry thought Hollis had been shot because the impact was so loud, but it was actually Hollis's skull fracturing. Larry thought that they were being robbed, and so she showed the man Hollis's empty wallet. She was then also hit, and she too fell to the ground. She was ordered to stand and then to run in a specific direction. While running, she saw an older car abandoned, but it was empty and the hooded man soon caught up with her. He asked her why she was running and she responded that he had told her to and he called her a liar. He knocked her down and sexually assaulted her with the barrel of his gun. After the assault, Larry ran away to a nearby house after failing to flag down a passing vehicle. Once at the house, she was able to wake up the residents who called the police for her. During this time, Hollis had regained consciousness and had flagged down a car. The driver had left Hollis at the scene and drove to a nearby funeral home to call the police. Police arrived and the hooded man was nowhere to be seen. Hollis's pants were found a hundred yards away from his parked car. Larry stayed at the hospital overnight and Hollis stayed for 12 days due to his skull fractures. They gave conflicting statements to police. Larry said that the man that attacked them was a light-skinned black man with a white bag over his head, and Hollis said that he was a dark-skinned white man and about 30 years old, but was not sure due to the flashlight that had been shined in his eyes. Both said that he was around six feet tall, and police believed the couple knew their attacker and were actually covering for them. The next attack occurred on March 24, 1946, when Richard L. Griffin, 29, and his girlfriend Polly Ann Moore, 17, were found dead in Griffin's 1941 Oldsmobile sometime between 8.30 and 9 a.m. on a different lover's lane after having dinner with Griffin's sister the night before. Griffin was found between the front seats on his knees with his head resting on his crossed hands and Moore was found in the back seat sprawled face down. Griffin had been shot twice while still in the car with his pants pockets turned inside out. Both had been shot once in the back of the head and both were fully clothed. A blood-soaked patch of earth near the car suggested to police that they had been killed outside the car and placed back inside. Congealed blood was found covering the running board of the car and it had flowed through the bottom of the car door. Rain during the night had unfortunately washed away any other evidence. A 32 caliber cartridge shell was also found at the scene, possibly shot from a Colt pistol that had been wrapped in a blanket. 
no sexual assault is believed to have taken place, police continued their search and the FBI soon became involved. Police even posted a $500 reward for a conviction, which instead led to over 100 false leads. The community believed that the attacks were isolated incidents and not related. The third attack occurred on April 13, 1964, when 15-year-old Betty Jo Booker was playing the saxophone with her band at their weekly gig at a club. At 1.30 a.m. on the 14th, her friend Paul Martin, age 17, came to pick her up. This is the last time they were seen alive. Martin's body was found around 6.30 a.m. lying on its side near the road, and blood was found on a nearby fence. He had been shot four times, once through the nose, through the ribs, through his right hand, and in the back of the head. Booker was found at 11.30 a.m., two miles away. She was fully clothed on her back, with one hand in the pocket of her buttoned overcoat. She had been shot two times through the chest and the face, and had also been sexually assaulted. Martin's car was found nearby with the keys inside. Police do not know who was shot first, but both were involved in violent struggles. Booker's saxophone was found six months later, in its leather case, in bushes near where her body had been found. The community really started to panic now that four people were dead and two others had been attacked in just two months. When Ben went to work, women and children moved into the downtown hotel called Hotel Grimm. People also started setting up booby traps in their houses for protection. At the time, the reward was increased to over $1,700 and rumors were starting to spread about possible suspects. Police confirmed these rumors were false and that no one had ever been arrested. The name The Phantom came from the headline Phantom Killer Eludes Police. May 3rd, 1946, Virgil Starks, a 37-year-old farmer and welder, was attacked around 8.50 p.m. at his house, 10 miles outside of Texarkana. Virgil was in his sitting room listening to the radio with a heating pad on his back. While his wife Katie, 36, was in their bedroom, she heard a sound from the backyard and yelled for Virgil to turn down the radio. Virgil was suddenly then shot twice in the back of the head through the closed double window. Katie didn't hear the shots, but she heard the clasp breaking. She went into the room and saw Virgil stand up and then slump back into the chair. She saw the gunshot wound in his head and ran to call the police. While trying to get to the phone, she was shot twice in the face from that same window that Virgil had been shot from. One bullet entered her right cheek and exited behind her left ear. The other entered below her lip, broke her jaw, and splintered multiple teeth before lodging under her tongue. She dropped to her knees, then was able to get to her feet and ran to get the pistol from their living room, but she couldn't see because the blood was pouring into her eyes. She heard the killer tearing open the rusted screen wire on the back porch. She thought she was going to be killed, so she stumbled towards the bedroom near the front of the house to leave a note. Meanwhile, the killer ran to the back of the house and made his way up the steps and into the side screen porch through the back screen door. She heard the killer coming through the kitchen window, so she turned around and ran through the dining room, through the bedroom, down a hallway, through another bedroom, and then finally into the living room and out the front door, leaving behind what was described as a virtual river of blood and tea throughout the house and across the street. Barefoot and still in her blood-soaked nightgown, she ran across the street to her sister and brother-in-law's house. Because no one was home, she ran an additional 50 yards more to another neighbor's house named Prater. Prater answered her call for help. She gasped, Virgil's dead, then collapsed. Prater fired a shot into the air to summon another neighbor, who got his car and the pair were able to drive Katie to the hospital. During the drive, she slipped in and out of consciousness, but she was not going into shock, and later was even able to be questioned in the operating room by the police. Due to the rising fear in the community, 20 to 30 police officers suddenly swarmed the farmhouse to gather evidence and question witnesses. When police arrived at the scene, reports say that the chair Virgil had been in was on fire because of the electric heating pad that had been on. The reports differ on whether his body was still in the chair or if it had slumped to the floor and had avoided getting burned. Investigators declared that after the killer shot Virgil, he waited patiently outside the window to shoot the wife Katie. Some clues were found at the scene, including the bullet used, a 22 this time instead of a 32, as well as a semi-automatic gun being used. A flashlight found underneath the window, and bloody footprints were found around the house. Believed to be the Phantom again, police set up roadblocks and picked up several men in the area and brought them in for questioning. Bloodhounds were used to track the blood from the scene down to the highway, but the trail was lost. A flashlight that was found at the scene was sent to Washington, D.C. to the FBI. 
an unofficial theory for the motive among officers was that of a sex maniac, as large amounts of money in the home were not taken, nor was Katie's purse, which was laying on the bed. The title on the front page of the Texarkana Gazette on Sunday, May 5th, 1946 read, Sex Maniac Hunted in Murders. On the night of Virgil's death, the reward fund was up to $7,025, and police urged the public to stop spreading misinformation about the crimes as it may hinder their investigations. Reports from the FBI came back, and the flashlight that was found at the scene contained no fingerprints. Instead, they put a picture of the flashlight and a headline reading, Have you seen this two-cell flashlight in the newspaper? Hoping to get information. Police then asked the public to report anyone who was out of place or had unknown whereabouts on the nights of any of the murders involved, and all rewards were combined to a total sum of $10,000. By 1948, police no longer believed the murder of Virgil and attempted murder of Katie to be connected to the other murders. Due to the older age of the couple, and the couple being killed at their house instead of at a car on Lover's Lane, as well as the different gun used. In 1946, rumors spread that the killer had been caught and was actually in prison, but police and newspapers report that this was false. Because no other people could provide a description of the killer, it is difficult to confirm what they ever looked like, or if they ever were wearing a mask during these other attacks. Police knew that they always attacked on the weekend, usually three weeks apart, and always at night. The Texarkana public became more and more concerned, and some teenagers even took matters into their own hands trying to bait the phantom so that they could kill them. At night, the town became a ghost town, with drops in sales forcing stores nearby to close early, and imagined reports of prowlers kept all the police in town busy. Police and volunteers even sat in cars parked on lovers' lanes as decoys trying to bait the phantom. Throughout the investigation, almost 400 people have been on the suspect list or have been questioned, with many suspects being eliminated. Since 1946, the town of Texarkana has come to terms with their legacy. In 1976, the film The Town That Dreaded Sundown, which was loosely based on the true events of the case, was released, despite the movie's claim that, quote, only the names have been changed because the movie claimed that the story you're about to see is true, where it happened and how it happened. The fabricated parts of the stories created much of the myth and folklore around the murders for the next several decades. The 1976 film also spawned a 2014 remake. In the town of Texarkana, every October near Halloween, the 1976 movie is played at an outdoor Movies at the Park event that's sponsored by the Department of Parks and Recreation. The tradition started in 2003, and approximately 600 people attend it each year. If you would like to hear the full list of suspects and all the evidence involved in this case, you can head over to the Castles and Cryptids episode 31, where I cover the case in depth. Until then, I hope you enjoyed. Thanks for listening, and keep it cryptic. Next up, we have a true crime story from Tiffany of Crime Over Cocktails. I just wanted to put a warning out there in the beginning that just in case, is if anyone had any like triggers or anything like that, that this may not be the episode for you. So I just wanted to give you fair warning. Amanda Taylor grew up in Florida with her mother and she didn't exactly have an easy life. She actually never met her father and her mom was an alcoholic so bad at the age 11 that her uncle Matthew decided to take her home with him and he lived in Christianburg, Virginia. When she moved to Virginia, she was able to have a normal life. She had friends, she went to school, she was getting good grades. She met her best friend, Mariah Roebuck, while at school, and they were inseparable from that point on. If you saw one, you saw the other. Mariah introduced her to another friend of hers, Rex Taylor. He was two years older than Amanda, but there was an instant attraction. They also had many things in common, like they shared the same birthday. They were both obsessed with horror, horror films, nasty, gruesome pictures. They were just obsessed with murder and killings and serial killers. So the three of them would just kind of sit around and watch horror movies all day. They loved the gore, the effects. They even had joined a community online that was everything horror. They were also talking with serial killers and was part of a serial killer fan club. Y'all know that existed because I did not. <laughs> so, 
Amanda ended up getting pregnant in the 10th grade and dropped out of high school. By March of 2014, they were already married for nine years and had two children, six-year-old Damien and 17-month-old Dela. Amanda's a loving mother. She likes to spend time with her kids. She likes to take them places, post pictures on social media. She just loved being a mother and she loved being with her family. But about eight years into the marriage, Rex was starting to get very depressed. He used to battle with depression in years before, but it seemed as if it was coming back. And he he just seemed to like always look like he was in pain. You, you could see the pain on his face. He wanted to be there for the family, but he, he just doesn't know how to shake it off. So he decides he's going to go and turn to his dad, try to get some good fatherly advice, see if his dad knows what he can do to try to shake off all this depression, how to get back to his normal self. So he goes and sees his father, Charlie Taylor. Now, Charlie tried to be the best dad he could be, but unfortunately, he had demons of his own that he was fighting. He was taking pain meds for an injured back for something that happened at work, but it was obvious that it became to the point where he, he was now abusing them. He was taking more than he should. You know, he's zonked out. So when Rex shows up looking for help, his father helps him really the only way that he even knows how to help. So he gives him a pain pill and said, now just relax. Rex at first did not want to take this. He's like, no, no, I'm not doing pills, this and that. But you know, he was just so desperate. His father promised it would make him feel better. So he trusted him and he took it. Before long, Rex is now also addicted to the pain medication and is also drinking heavenly on top of that. Amanda is not happy because now he's either drunk or high all the time and constantly begging him to just stop. Please stop. Go get help. You know, I need you. The kids need you. Stuff like that, you know? Like, clearly, one person can't do it all. He promised to get sober, but it was a promise he couldn't keep. So Amanda decides, you know what? I'm done. She takes the kids and she goes to her mother's house. He's a mess, begging her not to leave and that he will change. But she's heard it before. And she said, you know what? This time, no, you're not going to tell me. You're going to show me. You're going to have to show me that you can get sober and get clean. In August of 2014, Amanda was giving her son, Damien, a birthday party. It was his seventh birthday. Amanda even decided she, she invited Rex to come so he could see his kids for a few hours. But after time's going on, she's realizing he's, he's not there. They try to call him. He's not answering the phone. It's very odd. Even his mother kept calling him to see where he was, but he's not answering. And she just felt some, something's wrong. I got to go check it out. So she actually leaves the party and then heads over. She goes to the side door. She found him in the garage on his knees with a rope around his neck. He had hanged himself on his son's seventh birthday. Amanda is devastated. Rex was her life. She couldn't stop crying for days. She got so depressed. People were starting to get really worried about her to the point where she wasn't even taking care of her kids anymore. She couldn't get out of the bed. Her parents had to start taking care of the kids because she was just going deeper and deeper. So Mariah comes over one day and to see how she's doing. And Amanda was looking online at some videos. So she called her over to look at them. And Mariah was, I guess you could say, shocked. It was videos of people hanging themselves. She asked, like, why are you do why are you watching this? Why are you doing this to yourself? And she just told her, like, hey, relax. And then she would ask, which one do you think is the most relatable to Rex? Mariah's scared. She's like, okay, this has taken a creepy turn. Her obsession just grows and grows and grows. Amanda starts going into chat rooms, looking for another twisted soul, and ends up meeting Sean Ball, who claims to be ex-military in the Navy and has pictures all over the social media of graphic photos from war or ones that he just kind of thought were cool. So she sent him a message asking him, like, did you actually kill anybody? And she wanted to hear all the gory details. So she decides to bring her over to Mariah's house for a horror film marathon. 
It was obvious that Sean was smitten with Amanda, and he was trying to impress her. Some of the friends that were there also remember him telling her things, like, I can rip a man's head off with my bare hand. And that she just looked at him like, oh my god. <laughs> Your dream, man. So, coming up on March 27, 2015, it was Rex and Amanda's birthday. And this, this is the first one since his death. She told Mariah, you know, I, I don't know if I can handle it. I'm not sure I can make it. And she's telling her, you know, you can and you will. You're, you're going to be fine. We're here. They go to his grave and she just drops to her knees. She's crying. She's cleaning off the leaves on his grave. Just saying like, I love you. And then she just snaps. She puts a knife that she had in her purse and puts it up to her throat screaming i want to be with rex why won't you let me be with him her friends are able to get the knife away from her but they are all freaking terrified they didn't understand how it went from like zero to 100 or real quick i mean i'm sure they knew she was going to be some kind of emotional especially because she was drinking on the way there but you know they didn't expect her to do anything like that and especially because when they went to try to get the knife from her she started almost lash out back at them. So her uncle gets involved again and puts her in a five-day program in Redford, Virginia under suicide watch. They will only release her to a responsible adult. Well, after 48 hours, she's ready to leave. And she tries to call Mariah. Mariah's like, nope. She calls her mom, begs her mom, nope. Calls her uncle, nope. So they all want her to stay and get the help that she needs. She, she needs to fight these demons that she's going through or she's never going to heal. But she knows there is one person that will come get her. Sean Ball. As soon as she takes off with Sean, she gets on her social media account and says, when this monster entered my brain, I will never know, but it's here to stay. They go to a hotel to try to figure out what's the next step. Amanda says, I want Charlie dead. He's the one who gave him the pills. If it wasn't for him, Rex would still be alive. Without any hesitation, Sean gets up and he said, I got this. Got the keys to his Jeep and took off. When he came back, he had a gun and more than the necessary amount of ammo. To her, like, this is her knight in shining armor. She got all excited and just, let's go get him. So on April 5th, 2015, Amanda and Sean head over to Charlie's house. Charlie, of course, lets him in and he's a bit of a mess. He's crying and tells them that he's been thinking about, you know, hanging himself too and that he doesn't want to be without him. I wanted to be a good daddy. Amanda slowly takes the knife and as soon as it turned, 3:27 p.m. she attacked him with the knife stabbing him more than 30 times and stole money out of his wallet which only ended up being a few hundred dollars but turns out they were not alone in the house charles takes care of his disabled father he is bedridden in the bedroom in the back of the house when the cops arrive they speak to the father and he tells them that he recognized one of the people and that it was amanda with an unknown male when they try to trace Amanda's phone, they notice that she had removed the SIM card. That way that they can't track her location and she's untraceable. So then they head over to her socials to see what they can find out about her. And at first glance, it looks like she's a loving mom. There's a picture of her with the kids. And just as they're sitting there looking, a picture pops up with her and the biggest smile on her face while holding up a knife with blood running down it and Charles' dead body behind her in the picture. Captions read, I truly love my kids, but this is for Rex. They end up in Gatlinburg, Tennessee at another hotel. Amanda wants to know how many rounds of ammo they have. And Sean's like, yeah, enough. And she's like, all right, I want to kill every man over the age of 60. She's out for blood now, and she did not have a care in the world. While they're there, police now know who she is, and they start to look at Sean's socials, and they are horrified by what they find. They find pictures of people getting raped, murder, decapitations. They even thought that this may end up worse than expected. They're not going to stop. They're going to become serial killers. But Sean's starting to have second thoughts. You know, he, he was just doing this to win her over and impress her, but now she's, she's trying to go all out. And even though he said he was down for all the bloodshed, I think he was really ready to call it quits after Charles. 
he kept telling her that they just need to lay low. But Amanda's mind was made up. She she wasn't having it. I think Amanda could also feel that he was starting to back out. So she decides, let's go for a drive. And as they're driving, she's like, you know what? You're going to prove it to me. You're going to prove to me that you are in this with me, that we're in this together. So she eyes a jogger and says, I'm going to go get her and bring her back to the car. When I get here, you fucking shoot her in the face and we drive off. So she actually gets out of the car, runs after the jogger. Jogger starts heading back to the car. Sean backs out. So he, he won't even roll down the window. So the lady's like looking at him and you have Amanda who's like probably glaring at him at this point. And the lady just like, okay, and walks away. <laughs> kind of random, but thank God, Sean, he backed out. But that had to be such an odd encounter. So now Amanda is pissed. She drives a little bit further and then pulls over. She walks around the Jeep, pulls Sean out onto the ground and said, I used you for your car and guns and I hope you die. And then she shoots him twice, gets in his Jeep and fucking leaves him there. She is now alone and on the run. But while trying to get back home, she realized that she's lost. She has no clue where she's going. So instead of asking a stranger or going to store something, you're gonna love this. She calls the police. <laughs> and she warns them that the answering officer better not even think about coming to look for her. You know, don't you dare come looking for me. So the officer decides to talk to her as if he's actually concerned for her. He, you know, what, honey, let me bring you back home. Are you okay? What can I do for you? And it works. She told him I'm lost and I need your help getting back to Virginia. So he works with her to try to figure out where she is. And then realizes she had made it all the way to North Carolina. So he's able to track down where she's at in North Carolina. And he sends officers to her location and they take her into custody. They were able to retrace her steps and then found Sean's body. And he's actually still alive. He was shot in the jaw, which came out through the neck and into his shoulder. Back at the police station, after Amanda is in the interrogation room, I might want to redo that. Back at the police station, Amanda's in the interrogation room, and she makes a chilling statement. She tells them that, yeah, I killed him at 327 on purpose, since it was their birthday and it was symbolic to her. She said, ever since she's been watching all those horror films and looking at the pictures, she said that you could tell the people who took lives held power. And she wanted to have that power over Charlie's life. She recalled stabbing him and told them that she thinks she got him in the face and that Sean is the one who had the crowbar. Sean went to the hospital, was treated for his injuries, and then of course, off to jail he went. He got 41 years and Amanda received life without parole. Hi, this is Kelly. And this is Jenna. And you're listening to ODFM. This episode is one disguise for murder. Mm -hmm. So with ODFM, we are true crime and comedy podcast. Yes, if, tr if true crime and comedy had a baby. That would be ODFM. That had, that had a podcast, a baby with a podcast. <laughs> a baby you podcast. You would get our podcast. <laughs> so. <laughs> and uh, with every episode, the D changes. So that yes. is why this is one disguise. Okay. Yeah. Hit it. Are you ready? I think so. All right. I am taking you to Sun Valley, California, which is just northwest of North Hollywood. It's Halloween night, yes. 1957. Ooh, we're historical in we're this one. We're going historic, baby. Ah. All right. So we're at the home of Peter and Betty Fabiano. Ooh. And they live with Betty's uh, two teenage children from her previous marriage. Okay. It's late. It's after 10 p.m. The family has gone to bed. Trick-or-treaters have stopped coming around, right? Oh, God. It's, it's after trick-or-treating hours, right? When there's teenagers, there's always Still bad going. devilry, though. There's Jason the comes fun around. never stops, right? No. So the family is headed to bed. The doorbell rings at 11 p.m. And 35-year-old Peter gets up out of bed and he's like, oh, we're, it's a little late for this, right? He grabs the candy bowl and answers the door to find a rather tall trick-or-treater. You know, like like you said, the, the teens are the ones that come out later, yeah, right? Yeah, They're yeah, like, what? What's the big deal? Yeah, it's just um, 11. 
So it's a taller trick-or-treater with like, it was described as like a grotesque face. Like they, they did like grotesque okay. makeup, right? Yeah, really good. Um, and had what was called a domino mask, which I had to look up because I didn't know. That's huh. just like the little half mask that like Robin from like Batman and Robin wears, oh, no. you know, or like Zorro. I was like, that's a domino? A- that was the first I heard of that one. I had to hmm. Google that. Yeah. So domino mask and wearing what they referred to in that time as men's clothing, blue jeans, a khaki jacket and red gloves. I was Blue like, jeans, a khaki jacket. Okay. I, think I have that outfit. But no I'm shirt. I'm pretty sure. No. So, <laughs> well, I, maybe I it was like... just zipped up. I don't know. <laughs> no, was... I feel like it's the, coming into the 70s. He's like, right. yes, I'm ahead <laughs> of my time. Chain holding. Yeah. <laughs> Hanging down. Right. He answers the door and he kind of grumpily is like, it's a little late for this, isn't this? And a deep voice replies, no. And then no. a loud bang. Oh, God damn it. Turns out the paper bag that they were holding for collecting treats was really concealing a gun. He wanted all the treats. All the treats. Yeah. Wow. Right? That's rude. So Betty runs to the door to find Peter in a heap on the floor, bleeding Damn. out from a gunshot wound to his chest. Damn. Shooter has already fled. Betty's 15-year-old daughter, Judy Solomon, calls the police. Okay. Peter is rushed to Sun Valley Hospital and is pronounced dead. The press gets a hold of the story, and they dub it the trick-or-treat murder. Of course. Dun, 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 I mean, dun, yeah, right? it's very obvious. Right. This is 1957. So a local newspaper wrote this dramatic caption, a murder as fantastic as the spirits of Halloween. Um, does, That makes it sound great. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. that's awesome. What? No. But uh, yeah, that right. guy just didn't want the treats. He wanted something else. Yeah, right. There was one witness, witness witness-ish, a teenager, and all they saw was a car speeding out of the neighborhood. So it wasn't really much to go on. Okay, so at least we know that. Yeah, there was no shell casing. Wonder if it fell Ah. in the bag. Oh, right. that would be smart. Yeah, Because it doesn't sound like there was enough time to pick it up or find it or anything. Right, and that would be a genius way to do that so that it... It said nothing was taken from the house, although they did not specify candy. Oh, The bowl could have still been taken. He might have still taken the bowl and ran off. Right. I mean, um, I, I get it. You know, this is why you can't just pass out the crappy candy or toothpaste. People get True. Pissed, People get you know? toothpaste? <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that. Floss. <laughs> yeah. That's so mean. I thought right? pencils and pennies were mean, but toothpaste. Uh, yeah, toothpaste, right? Rude. Betty and her kids were left alone. Oh. So and, and nothing was taken. So police were like, all right, this looks more like a mob hit, a right. gang thing. So Betty and Peter met in the 1940s. Betty was already divorced and a single mother at the time. Peter was a successful hairstylist because with a last name like Fabiano. I mean, yes, you could have your own hair product line. (laughs) They got married while living in New York. And for the first few years, that's where they lived. And then they'd only moved to California about a year before the shooting happened. Right. Okay. Peter owned and operated his own salon in Hollywood, and he did very well. He was very popular. Oh, so you get all the stars. Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. uh, but there was nothing to show that he had any gang ties or Mm. uh, mob ties. So it was like, well, that's a dead end. He just messed someone's hair up really badly. Really, really bad, right? Someone who was connected. Right. Betty was sedated for several days after the murder because that's how they handled hysterical women. (laughs) Hysterical. She, oh, right. well, she was upset because her husband just got murdered. So, so we'll just knock you out, honey. <laughs> yep. <laughs> right? We'll just knock you out. Exactly. So oh, no. when Betty was finally conscious enough to be questioned, oh my God. Um, she told police that she thought she heard two voices that night. One that was masculine and one that sounded like a man impersonating a woman. Oh, but nobody saw another person, right? But nobody saw another person. And she wasn't at the door. So they asked her if Peter had any enemies, and she gave them the name Joan Rabble. I thought you were going to say Joan Crawford. No, not Joan. Oh, yeah. You mess up her hair. (laughs) It's like, oh, you are dead. Someone's getting taken out, right? No, Joan Rabble, who was born in Pennsylvania. She was a writer and a photographer, and she had been married. But after she was divorced, she came into Peter Fabiano's hair salon looking for work. Betty and Joan became fast friends, Hmm. and when Betty and Peter started having marital problems, Betty moved out and stayed with Joan. Okay. And they got closer, like like a lot closer. Oh. Oh. Um, um, The two women had what was described in those days as an abnormal relationship. But you wouldn't think in Hollywood in those days that'd be that abnormal. I guess they were still underground, basically. Yeah, it still wasn't spoken of right <sighs> okay 
But ultimately, Betty decided she wanted to save her marriage, right? So the couple reconciled, but not before Betty admitted to Peter that she and Joan had been more than friends. Okay. And he's not excited by this? (laughs) He was less than thrilled. (laughs) Oh, But he was like, okay, cool. But promise never to see her again. Betty's like, okay, Okay. right? So, but now Joan has lost both Betty, who she was in love with, and she also just lost her job. It, oh, good point. So, right. So she's heartbroken Oof. and pissed off. Mm-hmm. Right. So police pick up Joan, but there's no evidence tying her to the murder. But she's the only one in this triangle. She's, of, the, only, yeah. she's the only one who's got a grudge. Right. OK. But so they have to let her go. Two weeks later, an anonymous tip comes in and police recover the murder weapon, a 38 <gasps> Smith & Wesson, from the locker of a department store that was registered to a 43-year-old woman who was a medical secretary named Goldine Pfizer. So on November 12th, police arrest uh, Goldine at her home in Hollywood, which was just a mile away from Joan's home. Oh, interesting. interesting. And she was happy to spill everything she knew and actually <laughs> said, it was a relief to get it off my mind. Well, oh, at least boy. she had a guilty conscience about it. Yes. All right. So Joan and Goldine had met several months before and they bonded over coffee and how they were both now divorced, having both had married men in a way to disguise the fact that they were lesbians. Right. And that was right. common. Yeah. And I mean, shockingly, that didn't pan out. <laughs> right. Just, yeah. Like um, you can't fake it until you make it way. with this. Right. Stuff. So while Gold- Goldine was falling for Joan... Uh Joan talked incessantly about her friend Betty, who was married to this man who was pure evil. Right. Quote from Goldine was, she told me that Mr. Fabiano was a vile, evil man, a man who destroyed everything around him. She told me that he mistreated his wife and that he was dealing narcotics. Wow. She's not pulling any punches. No, not at all. There was no proof of any of that, by the way. All right. All right. Joan also said that Peter hated her, and oh. so her own life was in danger. Uh-huh. Yeah, this okay. is a dangerous so, man here, right? Just a little manipulative. So the only solution, naturally, is that oh. Peter's got to be taken out of the picture. Yeah. Right? I mean, there's right. no other... <laughs> what? We can move across the country? No. no. <laughs> yeah, no, that's We've not We've got to kill the person. That's the only right. option. So Joan gave Goldine the money to purchase a gun, oh, which she did. Joan borrowed a car from a friend. Okay. And on Halloween night, she was the one who gave Goldine this quote unquote men's clothing. <laughs> right. She basically wasn't wearing a dress. Um, <laughs> and with a, <laughs> right. the Robin mask. Gave her the Robin mask, gave her some creepy makeup, and then drove her to the Fabiano home. According to Goldine, after going to the door and shooting Peter, she runs back to the car. Joan thanked her. Oh, and then they sped off in the car. She also said that they both burned their clothing and returned the car to the friend. Then Joan told Goldine, forget you ever knew me. Oh, oh, well, wait, I didn't know I was going to be thrown out of this relationship. I know. What? She was like, wait, I thought we had a thing. I just killed someone for you, but okay. Wait, was, did I not prove my love? What? Oh, what? Sh- I just saved you, right? Wow. The next day, poor Goldine realizes... Wait, I still have the gun. So not knowing what to do with it, she rented the storage locker at the department store and left the gun inside. She is Um, obviously not the criminal mastermind. No. (laughs) It's like Goldie, run, run to Mexico. Oh, no. Joan Rabble was arrested. Both women were charged with first degree murder and pled not guilty. Uh Their trial was set for late December. And a judge ordered them to be evaluated by three psychiatrists. Oh, geez. They're going to try to. Oh, I know, right? (laughs) Okay. It was determined that because of their homosexuality, they were unfit to stand trial. (sighs) Hey, (laughs) well. Okay. That's ridiculous. It absolutely. It was not that long ago. It's really sad. No. So during her, one of her evaluations, Goldine said, I had no motive personally. Whatever motive I had was to please Joan. I was always easily influenced and I've always been impressionable and always trusting. Although that's pretty self-aware for someone who's really gullible. Yeah. (laughs) I I know how gullible gullible, I am. But I can't get over the gullibility. Like it just Uh, keeps hitting me. Oh no. (laughs) One psychiatrist wrote in his report on Goldine, the only thought she had was to save her friend Joan Rabble from an evil person. Uh-huh. She yeah. was saving him. She was doing something for her love. Yes. Uh, you know. Yeah. Whatever. 
So at their hearing, Goldine pled insanity. She was very remorseful at the hearing. She cried and she recounted the events of the night of the murder. Okay, right? good. Joan, on the other hand, sat there either stone-faced or with uh. a smirk. Oh, Oh, yeah, not doing herself any favors, right? Oh, Joni. Um, she even smiled as she was being led out <gasps> of the courtroom. Wow. Okay, well, that plays into the insanity. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. Wow. Or, I know I got, I can get out of this. Yeah. Whatever. I don't uh-huh. know. Both women ended up taking a plea deal for a reduced charge of second degree murder. Wow. And they were sentenced to five years to life in prison. Five. 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 <laughs> Five Ooh. to life. That's a big discrepancy yeah, right there. Um, There's a big, right? Are they not expected to live very long? This isn't like the 1800s where I, I, I don't die know. at Maybe 40. Because oh, no. It's actually unclear how much time they served, but both were released on parole. They just don't know. They're like, they I think they got no. out, but I'm not I sure. I read three <laughs> separate articles and they know they got out, but no one could say <laughs> definitively how long they were in prison. Uh, Bill, did you open the prison door again? <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> right? Goldine Pizer stayed in the Los Angeles area. In 1971, she became an officer of the Miracle Mile chapter of the Professional Women's Club. Hey. She turned things around. Yeah. She died in 1998 at the age of 83. Uh, Joan Rabble essentially disappeared after being released. <gasps> there is zero information on this Whoa. woman. Once she was put in prison and then at, at some point got out and then that's it. She just she poof. went and joined the mob. She's right. like in Jersey somewhere. Right. <laughs> she's well, she's wow. got her manipulation skills. She yeah. makes Betty Fabiano sold the salon and remarried in 1966. She okay. passed away in 1999 in Palm Desert, California at the age of 81. There has been speculation that she was in on the plot to murder Peter, but there's no oh. evidence. But it's yeah. interesting that she didn't go to the door, but she thought she knew how many people were there. True. Uh, you know, it's a little fuzzy hmm interesting hmm, right. yeah so was, but then yeah. she never got back with joan or no anything, she never so well, no, like, joan went undercover well, true. I, I don't know <laughs> joan but disappeared into the mob joan Who disappeared. Knows? we don't know what happened so anyways that is the story of the scandalous lesbian love triangle turned halloween murder of 1957 Wow. That was good. Would you like to hear my sources? I would okay. like to hear your sources. So, uh, thevintagewomanmagazine.com. Oh, vintage oh. woman. Don't we True. all wish to be a vintage woman? <laughs> right? It sounded no. glamorous. <laughs> um, TrueCrimeEdition.com and Vice.com. Join us for more stories. Yeah. Find us at ODFMPodcast.com. Thanks, StarCast Network. Happy Halloween, everyone. Happy Halloween. Thank you for joining us for Darkcast Network's Wicked Week. Join us tomorrow to see what's brewing in the Witch's Cauldron, spooky stories of witches. Once again, I'm Ray from Rogue Darkness Podcast, and this has been a Darkcast Network production, the best of dark indie podcasts.